All right, any questions before we start? So, um, so you've got your homework back for homework four. Uh, question one, everybody nailed, so that was great. Examples of um, the two fallacies. So, picking propositions. Um, again, showing something is not true, all you have to do is find one counterexample. So if you could find particular P's and Q's where uh, denying the hypothesis or affirming the conclusion was clearly false, that's enough to say that, that that's a fallacy. Um, so questions two through five, so I looked at two and four, um, and most people were at least on the right track, if not 100% there. Um, so make sure that what you write down in your proof is always a proposition. Make sure each statement is a proposition. It's got to be a declaration that has a truth value. Um, and so let's, let's just look at number two, prove that if n is even, then 6n plus 4 is even. And so you start with what you know, n is even, and this is your hypothesis. And what does that mean? n equals 2 times some integer k. That's the definition of even. And then we're trying to make a statement about 6n plus 4. Let's just do some substitution. 6n plus 4 equals 6 times 2k plus 4 equals 12k plus 4 equals 2 times the quantity 6k plus 2 that's algebra um, 6k plus 2 is an integer that's properties of integers and so 6n plus 4 is even and that follows from 3 4 and the definition of even because we showed that 6n plus 4 was 2 times something which is an integer and that's the definition of being even. So something along those lines constitutes a decent proof. Um, where you can get into trouble is if, for example, you write just 6n plus 4, right, it's not a proposition. 6n plus 4 is equal to something that is a proposition. Um, 6k plus 2 is an element of the integers. That's a declarative statement that's true or false. Um, if you start off with something like 6n plus 4 equals 2 times k, you're assuming that 6n plus 4 is even. You can do that, but anything that follows from here only follows once you know 6n plus 4 is even. And if that's what we're actually trying to prove, then that won't constitute a valid proof. You can try to do this by contradiction. You could try to set 6n plus 4 to be odd, but that's not going to end up leading to, um, it's probably not going to get you where you want to go. But, um, Anybody noticing anything odd about this question? No pun intended. What if n is equal to 1? What is 6n plus 4? 10. 10, which is even. What if n is 2? 16, which is even. 6n plus 4 is actually always even whatever n is as long as n is an integer. Because 6n plus 4 is 2 times 3n plus 2, and 3n plus 2 is an integer. So you could cut through a lot of this and just show directly that 6n plus 4 is always even. I didn't have that in mind when I wrote the problem. I just like noticed it later.
Um, we did some of these other ones related to numbers and their squares. We already showed that if n is even, then n squared is even. Um, if n squared is even, then n is even, you can do that with an indirect proof. Um, if you try to do this directly, star with n squared is even, so n squared equals 2 times some integer. Um, you might want to take a square root here, but that's going to get you into a world of, of complexity. Because it's just not clear what to go from there, especially since we're talking about integers and we don't really know anything about the square root of k or the square root of 2. Um, and we might just say that's not an integer and so it's a contradiction or something like that. But, but this doesn't really take us down a path of happiness. But if we say suppose um, n squared is even, that's the hypothesis. And suppose n is odd, that's an assumption. n is 2k plus 1, n squared is 2k plus 1 squared, which is 4k squared plus 4k plus 1, which is 2 times 2k squared plus 2k plus 1. That's all algebra. And this thing in the parentheses is an integer. And so n squared is 2 times an integer plus 1, which means n squared is odd, because that's the definition of odd. It can be written as twice an integer plus 1, and that's a contradiction between 1 and 6. And so we can come all the way back and say, therefore, this assumption was wrong, and so n is even. can't always do that, right? It's, it's not a, a totally magical wand, but a lot of times you can contradict the conclusion and argue to a, a contradiction and then you can say, okay, so the conclusion must have been true. But you have, to, you have to explore the problem to see if that works or if you need a direct proof or if you need something different. Um, it's not always the same. And then the easiest way to show that um, if n squared is odd, n is odd is again a proof by contradiction. n squared is odd, assume n is even. Um, what we saw in exercise three, if n is even, n squared is even, but we just uh, started off by saying n squared is odd, that's a contradiction. So n cannot be even, so n must be odd. So five follows with an indirect proof from three. So if you have questions about those, definitely ask. Monday when you do you you, you arithmetic progressions and you said any quote unquote reasonable arithmetic progression we start with where uh, the greatest common factor of A and B is 1 you're going to get an infinite number of primes mm -hmm. a, a k plus B right what did you re mean by a reasonable, reasonable? Um, so for example here's an unreasonable arithmetic progression Start at seven and count up by sevens. Can't read my mind. <laughs> Start at seven and count up by sevens. None of these are ever going to be prime because they're each a multiple of seven. Okay. Right? Okay. Or start at ten and count by um, by twenties. 
Okay. So if, if the thing you're counting by is a multiple of your starting number, yeah. it's not ever going to be prime. But other than that very sort of ridiculous case, any other case, you're always going to find an infinite number of primes. I don't know how that's proven. I don't know if it's complex or straightforward. I feel like I should know. All right, any questions on homework five coming in Friday? Exponentiation. So we talked about modular exponentiation. Well, fir first of all, there's there's just doing things on modular systems, right? Suppose um, suppose we want to compute three to the n modulo seven. If, if you start to play around with powers of 3 modulo 7, you find the following. 3 to the 1 is just 3. 3 squared is 9, which is 2. 3 cubed is 3 times 2, because 3 squared is 2, which is 6. And 6 is actually minus 1. right? It's 1 less than a multiple of 7. So if I were to square 3 cubed, this would be negative 1 squared, which is just 1. This is not an algorithm that's just playing around, right? Once I know that 3 to the 6th is 1, I know that 3 to the 6 times anything is also going to be congruent to 1. Because 3 to the 6 times 2 is 3 to the 6 times 3 to the 6 is 3 to the 6 squared. 3 to the 6 times k is 3 to the 6 to the k, which is just 1 to the k, which is just 1, because 1 multiplied by itself any number of times is still 1. So if I play around with powers of 3 mod 7 and I make a few of these observations, now when someone comes up to me in the street and says, hey, I'll give you a buck if you can tell me what 3 to the 605th is mod 7. Well, I know that 3 to the 600th is congruent to 1. So 3 to the 605 is congruent to 1 times 3 to the 5th. So all I got to do is find 3 to the 5th, and I get my buck. And I know 3 cubed is congruent to minus 1, and 3 squared is congruent to 2. So 3 to the 5th is congruent to just the product of those, which is just negative 2, which is also congruent to 5. Three to the six oh five minus five is a multiple of seven. So three to the six oh five is congruent to five mod seven. But I didn't have to use any numbers bigger than six to do that calculation. So that's one thing we can do, right? For some problems, we may find that that a little bit of single or double digit math gets us the answer to what would normally be a very big question. Um, a more kind of algorithmic approach is this thing called modular exponentiation. And here we take a systematic approach. So if we wanted to find 3 to the 605 
modulo 7. We write down powers of 3 that are themselves powers of 2. So 3 to the 1 is 3. 3 squared is 9, which is 2. 3 to the 4th is 2 squared, which is 4. 3 to the 8th is 4 squared, which is 16, which is 2. And now I've just got 2 and 4 alternating, so this will be 4, 2, 4, 2, 4, 2. And now I need to write 605 in binary. Anybody want to do that for me? Probably not. I could use my phone. Um, well, let's do it by hand. 605 minus 512 is 93. So it's no 256 is no 128. 164. And then it's 29 left over. So no 32s. Um, 116. I'm going to be really lazy. So that leaves us 13 left. So that's 8, 11. 12 and 13. I'm going to check it on my phone though. So 605 and we're going to go uh, binary. One zero zero one zero one 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 zero one. We're good. All right. So three to the six oh five is going to be three to the zero um, times three to the two. 3 to the 3, 3 to the 4, 3 to the 6th, 3 to the 9th. What the heck am I doing? Do you want pluses in there? Yeah, I want pluses in there. So it's 3 raised to that sum of powers. So it's the product of 3 raised to each of those. Did I lose you? No. Okay. And now I'm just going to fill in from my table over here. 3 to the 1 is 3. 3 to the 4 is 4. 3 to the 8 is 2. 3 to the 16 is 4. 3 to the 64th is 4. And 3 to the 512 is 2. And I still don't want to do any big math, so I'm just going to multiply 3 by 4 is 12 which is congruent to 5. And 5 times 2 is 10, which is congruent to 3. And 3 times 4 is 12, which is congruent to 5. And 5 times 4 is 20, which is 6 more than a multiple of 7. And 6 times 2 is 12, which is congruent to 5. I really hope that's what we got before. Was it? Yes, it was. That's congruent to 5. So it's, it's not as fast as just using a computer. But if we wanted a computer to do this for us, right, it's, it's a very, um, it, it can be turned into an algorithm very easily, right? Take your exponent, write it in binary, while computers think about these things in binary anyway. Um, 
think of each digit where we have a, a 1 as a power of 2 that's being added up to give us the exponent. Find what 3 raised to that corresponding power is, which we do first by just doubling our number each time to get to the next exponent. And then take those equivalent congruences and multiply them together. And you can multiply them two at a time, right, and reduce and multiply and reduce. And the largest number we ever had to deal with was 20. Right, and this doesn't rely on any tricks. This, this works whatever numbers we're using. I can handle that. That's pretty logical. Okay. And understandable, but I will want to kind of practice that before you give us a test on it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Could you do it a lot faster than I can do it? Yeah, it's, it's definitely something that you need to, to go through and do a few times. And if the first time you're doing it is on a test, that's going to be really unpleasant. But if you've done it's it on... It's understandable. Yeah. And we're going to do these on the, on the board in a few minutes. Um, so let me show you one other approach, which was just using this idea of Fermat's little theorem, which we talked about. Monday. And for some reason, Monday, I thought it was like Wednesday because I kept talking about Friday, thinking today was Friday for some reason. So, so Fermat's little theorem. So, um, under usual circumstances, a to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 modulo p. unless p divides a. If a is congruent to 0 mod p, then a to the p minus 1 is 0. But in general, a to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p. And so this is useful, for example, if we want to calculate um, you know, 15 to um, the 162nd modulo 17. Well, 17 is prime, and 15 is not a multiple of 17. So Fermat's little theorem will tell us something about this, or something close to this. Well, Fermat's little theorem actually tells us is that 15 to the 17 minus 1 is congruent to 1 modulo 17, 15 to the p minus 1. So we know 15 to the 16th is congruent to 1. Well, again, 15 to anything times 16 is also going to be congruent to 1. In particular, I can write 15 to the 160th. That's 15 to the 16 times 10, which is 15 to the 16th raised to the 10th, which is congruent to 1 to the 10th, which is just congruent to 1. So I want to answer something about 15 to the 162nd. Well, I already jumped up to 15 to the 160th with almost no work, and I know that's congruent to 1. So 15 to the 161 is congruent to 15 times 1, which is just 15. And 15 to the 162 is congruent to 15 times 15. And if I don't mind being slightly clever, I could say 15 is also congruent to minus 2. So this is congruent to minus 2 times minus 2 which is just 4 modulo 17. So 15 to the 162nd is far more than a multiple of 17. So that's using Fermat's little theorem. So congruent to 4 divided by 17, that's an integer. So those are three things we can do to, to do large arithmetic. All right, so before we move on and start using this stuff, which will be mostly what we do on Friday, um, I want to have people work on problems on the board to play around with these concepts and I'll watch what you do.
and we'll make sure we understand this. So has anybody looked at the other texts that are posted on Canvas? I posted a few other textbooks. Um, the textbook that we're using for the main textbook for this course doesn't really talk about a lot of number theory in the way that we're talking about it. It talks about actually some more advanced stuff um, that's number theory-ish. So there's, I don't know what I actually called it. Let me see what I called it. You stated a result just a minute, minute ago and used a result that maybe is something that I should know, but it was not immediately obvious to me um, when you said it and used it. You what got was to, that? Uh, you got to 15 to the 16th power is congruent to 1, mm -hmm. 17. And the next step, you just multiplied the exponent 16 by 10. Mm -hmm. You said any any power. If that's true, any power. Oh, okay, that's what you that's what you just proved in the, the next line. Yeah. Okay, I was I was understanding. Okay. That. Okay. I'm never 100% sure I get these things right, so <laughs> <laughs> always well, ask. You just proved it in the next line. You just said if I multiply anything by 16. Mm -hmm. I, you chose 10. Right. That was judicious in this case. But then you, you, you claimed that it would get you something congruent to 1. Right. And I didn't, I, I copied it down, but I wasn't thinking about okay, it. Okay, okay. And you, you're going a little too fast for me. But you just proved it right there, right? Just what you just said. You and can't get any multiple. And this is the part I'm never 100% sure about. <laughs> But I'm pretty sure right now that's correct. Well, but, you know, but that's the point. If you change in that middle one, if you change the parentheses to around 16 to 16 to the tenth power, then that's that, that's not necessarily equal. Right. Right. Take, yeah. Exponents take, don't associate. Like they so, don't associate. Yeah. But you think this one is correct? But yeah. So this is 15 to the 16 times 10. That's 15. Well, so this is this is what I do when I doubt myself. I do is I try numbers. that. Well, that would be that would be too easy. <laughs> You're make it hard. Yeah, yeah. All right. So it's 15 to the 16 added to itself 10 times. Um, Is that what you were going to say? No, actually, um, on the previous page, I was wondering if it says next to unless, unless p divides a. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right, so on Canvas, I have a link to other book, and it's called SWDM, which was Spiral Workbook for Discrete Mathematics. And I like this one because it has really good problem sets in it. I thought they were good problem sets. Um, Is that something you just found recently? Uh, a couple of years ago, I put it on Canvas, yeah. um, mainly for the number theory stuff, because number theory is not covered in our book. So uh, chapter 5 goes through a lot of what we've been talking about, modular arithmetic and Euclid's algorithm for greatest common divisor and fundamental theorem of arithmetic with primes and so on and so forth. So um, let's go all the way back to the beginning here. Let's do some congruence questions. You say you put this on Canvas so we can download this? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, an open, it's an open access okay. resource as far as I can tell. Um, so, so question one, find B mod A, forget about B div A, 
find B mod A um, for those three cases, and then find B mod A for these cases in question two. So go ahead and, and find a spot on the board, find some people to work with, um, and work on question one and two. And don't worry about the div thing, just, just calculate B mod A, and let's um, make sure we're clear on module operations. Yeah, go on to two. Yeah, 
to be, we were looking for 18 modulo 59. Oh, one. Oh. 18. Uh, yeah. We have to cut the time, right? So it's All right, good. So, so, um, so 300 mod 13 and negative 120 mod 11 and 79 mod 19 and 18 mod 59. And negative eight twenty three mod sixteen. All right, so um, your goal is to write three hundred equals something times thirteen plus some remainder. That remainder is going to be your answer as long as it's between zero and twelve in this case. Um, and you can do this by trial and error. You can see how many times 13 goes in. And 130 goes, this is a multiple of 13. 260 is a multiple. Um, and, and you can work it through like that. If you have a calculator, right, you can do um, 300 divided by 13. And it tells you it goes in 23 times. And then you can do 300 minus 23 times 13. And you got one left over. And that works great for, for positive numbers. Um, 79 divided by 19 is 4 point something. So 79 equals 4 times 19 plus, And then 79 minus 4 times 19. You've got 3 left over, so that's congruent to 3. The other thing you can do is 300 divided by 13 is equal to 23 point something. Subtract off the 23, multiply by 13, there's your answer. 79 divided by 19 is 4 point something. Subtract off the integer part, multiply that by 19, there's your answer. So if you're stuck on a subway with a train and, and with a calculator and you need to do these things, um, you can be pretty efficient with it. All right, the negatives make things a little strange. We want to write negative 120 equals um, something times 11 plus something. And we need this to be between 0 and 10. Um, and 120 change sign divided by 11. Well, it goes in negative 10 times. And so if I do negative 120 minus negative 10 times 11, I get negative 10, which isn't exactly the final answer I want because it's got to be between 0 and 10. But I can add 11 to that and get something in range. And that'll give me my 1. The other thing you can do is you can just add some big multiple of 11 to make this positive because adding a multiple of 11 won't change it. right? So I could do. Um, minus 120 plus, I don't know, I could add 1100 and get 980. So this is going to be the same thing as 980 modulo 11. And now I can divide by 11 and it goes in 89 times with a little bit left over. And that little bit left over is just 1 11th. So there's different things you can do, and and I think it's useful if you've got some time to kill to just like play around with these kinds of things, because it helps you sort of internalize what's going on, right? Better than than writing a description of this out in words or stating a theorem or something will necessarily help. Um, 18 mod 59 is just kind of subtly tricky. 18 equals something times 59 plus something. 
Well, 59 goes into 18 zero times, and you've got 18 left over, so this is just 18. And anything mod something bigger is just that original anything. Right, because this is a valid number between 0 and 58. Does that make sense? That one's always a little disconcerting. And then negative 823, I don't know. I might just add like 1600. So that's 777. Find that mod 16. Divided by 16 is 48 point something. Take off the 48. Multiply by 16. That should be 9. Is that what people got for that last one? Sweet. Sorry? Did you get seven? No, I'm worried. Um, let's try it, the original. 823 divided by 16, so it's 51 with some extra left over. So let's do 823 plus 52 times 16. So it should have nine left over. But nine and seven is 16. So there might be something. Try it again, and if you still get it, we'll take a look at it. So, probably. All right. Um, let me talk about some of these. Prove that among any three consecutive integers, one of them is a multiple of three. So if you take any three integers in a row, 5, 6, 7, um, 20, 21, 22, always one of them is a multiple of 3. Right? We believe this. 34, 35, 36. 36 is a multiple of 3. And if you think about it enough and you start playing with some examples, you'll probably believe this is always true. But we can actually show it pretty easily with modular arithmetic. And so this is a style of proof that we can use in a lot of situations. So, so this is a simple example, but it's pretty powerful. Um, so let's prove for any integer n either n, n plus 1, or n plus 2 is a multiple of 3. Well, since we're talking about multiples of 3, let's think about modulo 3. We could rephrase this as saying for any n, either n, n plus 1, or n plus 2 is congruent to 0 modulo 3. because that means it's a multiple of 3. Well, we can do this with three possible cases. So there are three possibilities. Case 1, n could be congruent to 0 mod 3, in which case we're done, because n's a multiple of 3. Case 2, n could be congruent to 1 mod 3. Or case 3, n could be congruent to 2 modulo 3. Does everybody agree that one of these situations has to be true? Because n is always congruent to either 0, 1, or 2. Well, if n is congruent to 0, then n is divisible by 3. And we're done. If n is congruent to 1, then n plus 2 is congruent to 1 plus 2, which is 3, which is 0. So 3 divides n plus 2. So n plus 2 is a multiple of 3. And if n is congruent to 2, then n plus 1 is congruent to 1 plus 2, which is 3, which is 0. So 3 divides n plus 1. 
So there's only three possibilities, and each possibility we showed that three divides either n, n plus 1, or n plus 2. That proves the theorem. And that's a nice result because we've just made a statement about all integers. There's an infinite number of integers. If we had infinite paper, we could do this by just looking at every integer and showing that this property is true. But that's an infinitely long proof. But with a very short proof with basically three steps, we made a statement about all integers. And we did that by making a statement about what they're congruent to mod 3. So it's this reduction of this infinite set down to a very small finite set. This is a really good hammer. We can swing at a lot of things. Um, prove that n cubed minus n is always a multiple of 3. I mean, is it true? You can plug in some numbers. 1 cubed minus 1 is 0. That works. 2 cubed minus 2 is 8. Minus 2 is 6. That works. 3 cubed minus 3 is 27 minus 3, which is 24. That works. So it must always work, right? So let's break it into cases. So if n's congruent to 0, what is n cubed minus n congruent to? Yeah, 0 cubed minus 0, which is just 0 minus 0, which is just 0. Since n, so we're, we're just working over mod 3 everywhere. Since n is congruent, if n is congruent to 0, then 3 divides n. But it could be n is congruent to 1, in which case n cubed minus n is... 1 cubed minus 1, which is again 0, and so 3 divides um, n. Sorry, divides n cubed minus n. Right, n cubed minus n is congruent to 0. And the only other possible case is n is congruent to 2, and n cubed minus n is congruent to 8 minus 2, which is 6, which is congruent to 0. And so in that third possible case, 3 still divides n cubed minus n. And any n we pick, one of these three cases is going to be true, and we've just shown 3 will divide n cubed minus n. And so 3 divides n cubed minus n for all integers n. Try one on the board. Yeah. All right, so only talking about integers. So let's prove that any even square number which is the square of another integer. Any even square is a multiple of 4. 
and try a few test cases first to make sure this seems plausible because if you find a counterexample, then, then I'm doing something wrong. But any even square, for example, 100 is a multiple of 4. So see what you can do to prove that using this idea of breaking things down into a few cases. And you can do this on the board. Try, try to do it using modular stuff, because what you're doing right now is going to get you approved really quickly. But <laughs> <laughs> so, and just run to zero two three. about what modulo you're working in and make sure you write that yeah. down to yourself on it. So you could cut out case two and four. But you can do it this way, and yeah, you'll quickly cut out case case two and four. But because those are on each other, so.
is congruent to two? You say n squared is congruent to two. So n squared is n times n, right? So n times n. Well, this is congruent to two. So yeah, once you see it, this one is, is just a few lines. Um, since this is an even square, either n is congruent to 0 or n is congruent to 2, working mod 4, because we're interested in divisibility, it'll be like 4. And if n is congruent to 0, n squared is 0 squared, which is 0. If n is congruent to 2, n squared is 2 squared, which is 4, which is also congruent to 0. And so as long as n is an even number, or its square is even, then that square is divisible by 4. So you never find a square in the form of 4 times something plus 2, which is kind of interesting. And what happens if n is odd? Either n is congruent to 1 or n is congruent to 3. If n is congruent to 1, n squared is just 1. If n is congruent to 3, n squared is 9. And what's 9 mod 4? That's still just 1. So odd squares are always in the form 4k plus 1. Even squares are always in the form 4 times k. And you never find a square that's either 2 or 3 more than a multiple of 4. which might be useful to know. And you can use that in a lot of cases. So in the set n, n plus 4, n plus 8, n plus 12, n plus 16, at least one of those is guaranteed to be a multiple of 5. And same thing, work mod 5, break out 5 possible cases, and you'll see that exactly one of these is congruent to 0 mod 5. So let's do some GCD work, and then we're probably good for the day. I didn't give you a break, so I'll let you out a few minutes early. So you remember Euclid's algorithm for greatest common divisor? So to find a GCD of two numbers, write the first number as something times the second number plus something left over. And I don't know what this goes into. I will cheat with a calculator. I'll cheat with a binary calculator. So 170 and 15. So 170 is 11 times 15 plus 5, and 15 is something times 5 plus something, well, it's 3 times 5 plus 0. Once you get down to a 0, this is your greatest common divisor. Okay, so you remember that from Monday? All right. So, um... So work on questions one and two, and don't worry about the linear combination. Just find the greatest common divisor of those pairs of numbers.
and let's get some practice with the Euclid's algorithm. So is two just more of the same? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Oh, whoops. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're benefiting from 
Thank you. some board work with modular exponentiation and such next time and then um, we'll start talking about applications including uh, working up the cryptography and crypto systems so we'll be doing that on Friday um, unless you're burned out from the midterm in 224 and then we'll just have milk and cookies or something all right so I'll see you next time <laughs> <laughs>